All right, we are live again. Oh my God, I'm so excited. It's been a while, I know, and I've been missing inviting people to talk with uh, sustainability environmental leaders. So thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Olga Bolotina. I am longtime sustainability environmental advocate. I have a whole resume behind me, so I'm not gonna go into it, but today I am here to welcome you to In The Know and uh, uh, welcome uh, our wonderful Joanne Drabeck, who I'm so excited to uh, speak with today. It's been a while since we actually, um, well, we checked in actually a few times recently, but it's been a while since COVID hit that we were able to participate in any event. So I'm very excited to have Joanne here. And um, she, uh, we were just joking before we came on and she avoided very much to put any specifics in her, in her bio. Um, but uh, Joanne is um, the outreach um, um, uh, chair of the outreach committee for the Sierra Club of the chapter now, but she also worked for the chapter um, for 10 years. So, and we were just chatting a little bit before, before we came live about that. So, and I'm excited to ask John about all of that, you know, chapter of her life and chapter of the chapter life. Um, but Joanne um, started hiking or, well, hiking, camping, right? Your parents took you hiking at the age of eight and then you just fall in love with that. We also, I found out that we have a lot in common in terms of our interests. I am fascinated with human psychology, human behavior, why we do what we do, what motivates you. And that partially why I started in the know because I wanted to know why people who are volunteering, who are acting and who are active on a high level and accomplishing things, what motivates them and what brings them to, to environmental organizations, to uh, leadership, et cetera. So I'm very excited to touch on that. Joanne is a mother of how many daughters, Joanne, actually? I was like, you also avoided that detail. <laughs> Oh, okay. No, I have two daughters. Children. I have two children. I started camping when I was eight, and I started each of my children camping when they were about a year and a half. So they, wow, nice. Yeah. And and I must have they been, they also are. And I was gonna say that also, we have a little bit of an other sound delay. I'm not sure if um, that's on your end also, or is it just on my end? I, it's a little yeah there's some awkwardness sorry audience yeah. but we'll sorry yes we double we double triple checked everything went back and forth but hey you know what it, it, when you go in life it's always um uh, something changing sometimes anyway so um so you were saying that you started uh hiking at eight and then you took your daughters also at the age of um year and a half, year and a half. hiking year and a half wow yeah you that children are healthy when they get in the dirt <coughs> and I can remember my older daughter who's now 41 uh, camping at about a year and a half and the Cheerios go in the dirt and she climbs down from the picnic table and eats the Cheerios right out of the dirt so that that's the kind of attitude uh, we have towards the out of door it's all part of us and um yeah, it was wonderful. I also, my husband Thor is also an avid outdoors person. Uh, he fell in love with the mountains when he became a park ranger one summer in Yellowstone. Oh, wow. And it was this time west of the Mississippi. And um, he uh, loves going to the mountains and he's away as long as we have been uh, this year. It's, it's been a little bit hard. But it does help. Oh wow! I, mm -hmm. I don't have. To I didn't that. realize that Thor is also is also involved in nature, you know, preservation. So because I, I we met Thor so many times because we do used to do in person, you know, holiday celebrations, etc. And Joanne, uh, as many of you know, is actually the the amazing host and an amazing organizer of a lot of events that, that we've been holding at our old now chapter office that is gone now, but also a lot of tabling at events, et cetera. So Thor is great. Yeah, I'm amazing volunteer also. So thank you. Wow. So the whole family is yeah. basically involved in nature. Uh, 
no. And, and we were very lucky that both of our children took to the out of doors. We have friends whose children went through periods of, I'm not going on a walk. And both of our daughters love hiking and love being out of doors and um, choose to spend their holiday time uh, doing activities like that and their weekends. Yeah. Do they work also in anything, you know, ranger, nature related? Uh, or no. not really? My uh, older daughter works uh, for a private school. She's director of admissions here in Oakland. No, uh, oh, wow. My younger daughter lives in Denver, the what crown prince area of outdoor living. And uh, it's a good fit for her. Um, but she's a uh, marketing manager for Lily's Chocolates, and they're a, a small. That's right. You mentioned that. It makes sugar-free chocolates. Yeah. So. Sugar-free. Ooh, nice. Oh, I know they. Sweet okay. All kinds of alternatives that um, are are natural, but are not beet or cane sugar. Nice. All right. Well, I know where to go for, for my presence now. <laughs> hey, Valentine's Day is quickly approaching, right? <laughs> Slight advertising. Okay. Great. So, so you also, you mentioned that you've been interested in the child um, education, childhood development. So, and you didn't mention anything, if I may ask, I am curious about what, what were your, you know, work and, and studies before you joined the Sierra Club and, well, and way back when um, I was interested in psychology and in my first you know, intro psych class, they say psychology isn't the study of an individual. This was not clinical counseling. It's a study of humans as, as a group, you know, or mm -hmm. subgroups. And, uh, but I was always liked kids and was interested in children, child behavior. I went to High Wesleyan University and on campus, there was a what they called at that time a laboratory preschool. It was run by the university. Um, the children that came were professors' children and children from the uh, community, Ohio Westlands in a small town of about 10,000 north of Columbus, Ohio. And um, I did volunteer work in the uh, preschool setting. I mm -hmm. took some classes that related to observing kids in the preschool setting. One of the college professors was her PhD was in child development. And uh, so she always was thrilled to have people being interested in children because everybody else was interested in, most people were interested in working with some of the other professors and, you know, running those rats around yeah. mazes and things like that. And, that was never really nice to tell you the truth. So my independent study was on um, short-term memory and three and four-year-olds. Um, when I got wow. when I got done with college, I said, "Okay, now what do you do?" I went into Vista Volunteers and Service for America. The program is still exists, but it has evolved greatly. It's morphed into more like Teach America. And. Mm -hmm. um, but I worked in Richmond, Virginia, and again, I found myself working with preschool children and uh, canvassing people in neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods, of course, because it's a publicly funded mm -hmm. program, that, um, mm -hmm. you know, to see what kind of needs parents felt they needed to help uh, support their children. And mm -hmm. uh, when I got done with my year uh, in Richmond, Virginia, I uh, ended up in Ohio, basically because it was closer to where a certain person was in medical school in Toledo, Ohio. And um, mm -hmm. he, uh, you know, I didn't wanna be super close because I wasn't sure what the long-term relationship would end up being, but I didn't wanna be too far Are away. Are you talking about Thor? I certainly, <laughs> And um, so this goes back to uh, sometime in the mid 70s or early 70s. And 
so I worked with uh, preschool children, uh, again, running a daycare program and two preschool programs in Lorain, mm -hmm. Ohio. Uh, when it came time for Thor finished medical school and was accepted into the residency program at Kaiser Oakland. And uh, I, he asked me to move with him and I said, yes. And we've been together ever since. So that was in 1974, wow. it's been a long time. Wow. Congratulations. I need Great. to ask you, I ask you questions. What, what are the secrets of a long term relationship? Actually, I was just thinking about it. I was like, you know, so many people, especially now in COVID, it's like you hear divorce and you know, domestic violence. Yeah. So, so I, I would love to hear some, some tips there. <laughs> to get to the early childhood part of my life, I, when we mm -hmm. moved out here, it was really to say I wanted to continue working with that. And I had mm -hmm. um, some jobs in um, preschool programs. One was a pre-head start program and one, mm -hmm. and then I worked with abused children at Children's Hospital. There was a, a trial program where children who were abused came to this preschool mm -hmm. uh, five mornings a week and the parents were in um, therapy with a counselor in the same program. And we wow. had the parents actually in the classroom with the children one day a week. So uh, hopefully to improve their awareness and knowledge of child development mm -hmm. and um, learning some techniques on how to deal with certain behavior or just get along or just and for some of the parents just learning how to and be to play with your kids um mm -hmm. uh, then I had my own kids and I was PTA mom I was fortunate I could stay at home I was PTA mom for years and years and years uh and when I got done at the other end that's when I decided or when my children were young is the Pete says, mm -hmm. I wanted something that wasn't to, to do some work once a week that wasn't had didn't have anything to do with children. I didn't want to talk about children. <laughs> I didn't want to talk to children. I wanted something totally different. And I saw an ad in the Yodler saying uh, volunteers wanted to come to this meeting. So I showed up mm -hmm. and I started answering the phones as a volunteer receptionist. And um the rest and the chapter of the office, yeah, and the rest of the office. And this was uh, back in about 1983, late 83. Yeah. And um, the office was in the back of a bookstore on College Avenue. Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't even know that. You know what? <laughs> now I believe a shoe store. So, wow. Wow. You know what, but before we get, get to the whole Sierra Club chapter, you know, I'm curious because there's so much, I mean, you sort of uh, glanced over it, but I mean, working with children, working with abused children, working with, you know, families that, that are going through challenging times. And it's like, are, are there any stories that stood up, stood out for you? And I know that at the end of it, you decided, you know, you wanted something different, but something kept you there for a long time. So any any stories that stood out years um i think uh it's amazing how resilient some people can be both uh, adults and children some of the mm -hmm. stories are most of the stories are just heart-wrenching and um and you most people would just you just walk away and shake your head and say well how can they possibly think that is good but when you get to know these people, um, you find out that they are more than just people who have hurt their children. They are people that sometimes love their children, sometimes they don't. Um, mm -hmm. Love, I don't think is, is, you know, I don't think everybody has a child and says, oh, isn't this the greatest thing in the mm -hmm. world? Those are the stories you read about in the newspapers and in novels and things, but those aren't always the stories. And um, I think I remember one mother that I actually had met in my first full-time job in Oakland, mm -hmm. working at a pre-Head Start program 
the children we worked with were from six weeks old to three years and then they their parents came and these these were happy healthy families for the most part and one grandmother brought <laughs> her grandchildren and um i can remember thinking oh i wish she would you know offer to work here she was so good mm. with children. and uh and then so many years later not that many really a few years later i'm in another program working with abused children and her children her grandchildren come through to the program and um the parents of the children her daughter and her son-in-law were the people having trouble coping with children her her natural gifts didn't get passed on and most of us oh, wow. you know it, it's like kittens or cats may have, you know, natural instincts on how to raise their kittens, but people don't have that. It really is learned behavior. And um, some of us have more natural inclinations than other to be nurturing, but uh, these parents needed a lot of help and a lot of education. And uh, I just felt fortunate that they were able to get some help, but I also felt fortunate the children were fortunate to have a grandmother uh, and a grandfather who were very, very supportive for them and nurturing to them. So they had a more broader experience in life to know that people can be nurturing mm -hmm. and be rough and um, to know, uh, yeah. How things turn out. So some of the time it's just the resilient yeah. children and, and parents. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's, I think grandparents just in general, when we have grandparents, especially the loving ones in our life. And I have, I, from my personal experience, I think that, that my grandparents just absolutely key people in my life, you know, I mean, talking about hiking, gardening and, and nature. I mean, my grandmother, really, my mother's mother was the, the instrumental person who I think she, she took me in, in you know, I was born in April, so you know Russians in the in summer spend basically on dachas or the out you know uh, okay. on the on their summer sort of houses. Yes, and and there was wilderness completely. You go out and there's just you know bears and moose and and squirrels and hedgehogs you know running around free in the you know little little paths to to go through the wilderness. Um, and she, she, I think she took me to forest like when I was like two, three months old. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, so she was instrumental in my life. So it's it's truly important to have, you know, some, and I, I kind of, um, you know, talking about cultures, especially, I feel like um, th there's such a difference in United States versus some of the cultures where, you know, it really takes a village to to raise a child. And I think that we sort of lost that a little bit. I think we're going back towards that a little bit more where people understanding that they can just, we cannot dump, the, so to speak, the, the care for the child on on two parents, you know, who have to also work full time and do so. It's, I think it's good that we sort of forced slightly now because of the socioeconomic um, conditions to sort of expand our families and bring people more together so anyway that, at least that's my sort of well, positive spin on the situation how about that <laughs> individual family the yeah. family concept um didn't didn't serve us well it kind of went towards that individual you know, me, me, me kind of thing instead of us, us, us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having uh, extended families uh, involved with each other is important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, and I, and I know um, households where uh, the parents maybe 50 years ago would have said, there's no way my kids are going to live with me when they're adults. And yet here in this day and age, they do. Mm -hmm. and many cultures, those multicultural, multi-generational families are 
prevalent and um mm -hmm. but in a lot of uh white european descendants uh we got away from that and so it is it is nice to see it it back because i think it is important uh for uh, children to know as many loving adults as they can. Uh, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Well, and also I think it's actually good for, for everybody because, you know, I, I think that adults and older adults also, it's so much, you know, they're sort of getting present back into this awe and admiration and curiosity and sort of, you know, running around so I, I think it's good for for everybody when it's good again you know and, but but also i wanted to ask you because you know you clearly worked in those you know with those difficult situations for a long time so did you have any sort of any tools or anything that you did to keep you positive keep you you know, balance instead of because my experience of you is also very grounded, very, very positive, very friendly, you know, so, so what did you do? Yes, so I, I did two things. One, we set up the program when I was working with the abuse kids that the whole staff, both the teachers working with the um, children directly and mm -hmm. the counselors mostly were uh, masters had MSWs, masters of social work degrees. Uh, and there were some PhD uh, counselors mm -hmm. they, um, who were working with the parents. We would have staff meetings that were the nitty gritty. And we would also have staff meetings which were supporting each other emotionally to talk about you know, what families needed. And in that process, it's also mm -hmm. what did we need in support of that? Um, which I thought, especially as, as, as you get into it, um, you know, mm -hmm. the first, first few weeks you go, what is this? And then as you uh, get more involved with the children and, and the parents and you realize it's, the answers are not easy, uh, having mm -hmm. support was necessary. The other thing is at that point, I did not have children. And I would go home every day after work and I would mm -hmm. sit couch on I would not move for an hour I would literally just sit there um wow. and we had <laughs> the poor dog we had a dog at the time and he got put out in the run and you know he all he wanted was love and attention because he had been we had a dog locked up <laughs> he, yeah he had hours love and in, in the middle of the day but um he was, he was ready. He was also very young at the time and mm -hmm. he, um, he wanted attention and he didn't get his walk until after I sat there for an hour just to decompose. And it was sort of, wasn't true meditation, but it was sort of just like clear, mm -hmm. mind, not, try not to think, mm -hmm. it, just sit there and just, and just be. Um, yeah. and, and that would kind of give me the transition energy. Also, when I, decided to have a child or Thor and I decided to have a child. Um, mm -hmm. It gave me pause. It's like, do I want to continue to work or do I want to not work? And I mm -hmm. realized um, as I would sit there, I don't have the energy. I don't have energy to take care of a dog. How am I going to have energy to raise a baby? Uh, so after um, when I did get pregnant and, and, and left the job, mm -hmm. I quit because I knew I couldn't do both. I couldn't raise a healthy child. I didn't have the energy and wherewithal to raise a healthy child and give these uh, children in the mm -hmm. program I was working in the energy and devotion that they needed and deserved. So um, and that's when uh, I left working with abused children. I did go back later and work with children. I uh, ran an infant toddler program in a preschool for mm -hmm. two years. Um, and, uh, but, uh, and I did, uh, when my own children were in high school, I did volunteer work in a local um, elementary school and kindergarten, first, second grade depending on the year where I would go in twice a week and 
support the teacher usually in reading programs. Um, mm -hmm. the children would be divided into different groups. There'd always be somebody or a group of somebodies that just didn't seem to fit in group A or group B. And um, if I could help them twice a week, um, it, it worked. Did they all become Steve Jobs of the of the world? No, no they did not. <laughs> any of them are Steve Jobs but hopefully they all know how to read that well, that was the goal and, mm -hmm. and and one and with one group of children it's just mm -hmm. there, there were three of them and they just weren't getting it and different children learned to mm -hmm. be different ways and my children mm -hmm. when they were in elementary school learned phonics and what the phonics you phonics. mean that through through uh-huh uh what, what is it? I'm so sorry. I don't. Uh -huh. Oh, so, so you learn to read, you look at things and you sound it out. So um, S has a s sound, E, E has an E sound. And so you put E together and you have C. And then you're there sightly. Uh. You see these shapes, the S, the E, and the E, and you see them together and you rotely learn that's the word C. This. Ah. Uh. And um, that's the, that was more how the children in Oakland were reading that way. And many children can't learn, mm -hmm. don't learn that way. So I, would, I went uh, and pulled out all my children's um, phonics books. And the school mm -hmm. that um, I happened to keep in touch with some of their teachers over the years. And mm -hmm. one of them said, well, we're not using that program anymore here's the teachers she loaned me the teacher's manual for the system that my kids had learned and i and i didn't do it you know i used i used it as a guide let's put it that way i didn't do it per se but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um and and i could actually watch at least two of the children one had much more difficulty learning but mm -hmm. He, the two of them, it's sort of like they started to get it to the point where they could go and join the other group there, you know, and be with them and learn mm -hmm. in the sight manner uh, because they had this other set of tools to work. So that was, you know, it was mm -hmm. very rewarding. But that's what I did uh, rewarding with three or four years, um, yeah, with, with volunteer work with kids. Yeah. You know, it sounds amazing. And I, I, for, for whatever reason, you know, sometimes universe brings you, you know, people from different backgrounds. And I actually talked uh, just serendipitously uh, in the last few months, I would say, with a lot of teachers and special education teachers also. Um, <clears throat> and the stories that I heard, you know, that, that people sort of, you know, out of sight, out of mind, especially in people who don't have children or have, you know, um, didn't go through public um, schools. Oh my God, the stories are just, you're right, uh, hard ranging. And, uh, you know, the, just the inability of the system to pay attention, I think, to, to kids and their special needs. I think you're right, we're all unique. So, right. you know, so what do we don't know how to do something? We have some other skills and, and um, some of the most talented and gifted, you know, accomplished people, <clears throat> you know, now it's all coming out, you know, because it's, I think, much more accepted um, that a lot of them had dyslexia or some other, you know, inabilities in one thing, but became, you know, amazing amazingly talented and accomplished in other areas so well thank you for all this work I mean, as I, I'm, I'm actually learning <laughs> a lot too and I think it's so important volunteering I think I'm coming back and back to giving back your knowledge especially when the system is not able to provide that I think it's extremely admirable so thank you oh my god we should have had this this conversation like I don't know 20 years ago <laughs> 20 years ago I know, I know. Well, and that's partially why I was so excited because it's like I'm working and and sh shoulder to shoulder with people who are know very little about, and we don't have. We're all so busy and volunteering and involved in projects, and we hardly get to know each other. You know, yeah, so I know, I know, you know, it's like 
so when it comes to what I do with the Sierra Club, I really like getting people together so that they have that that social time. I'd much rather mm -hmm. work with the party than a campaign to keep coal out of Oakland. I, you know, admire the people doing that work and steadfastly <laughs> following, I know, following what's happening in the courts and following mm -hmm. what's happening other, um, organizations and doing all the coordination and getting there so that uh, the person like me who doesn't want to do that can just sign the petition or show up at a hearing or um, be in a march, but uh, yeah. It's also important. It's all important, I think that, but I was joking when I was uh, watching all the, you know, climate marches and, and women's marches, I was like, and why are we not having like a table right here to sign all of those people to vote and volunteer and uh, you know make sure that we capture them in some other ways to yeah. to you know, do some other work. So but, um, yeah, no. yeah, they, yeah, that, it's uh, there are all kinds of people out there doing all kinds of things, and it's yeah. nice to volunteer. Um, in the Sierra Club, because there are just so many different ways to participate. You know, you can be really passive, mm -hmm. really aggressive, or not aggressive and as far mm -hmm. as physically aggressive, but a energy aggressive. Or really I know now the word should be used carefully, right? Yeah, I know. It's kind of, <laughs> what did he mean by that sentence? So um, I know. Ay, ay, ay. But uh, uh, no, you know it. And, and, and we need all, all the levels of, uh, of participation. We can't, uh, we can't have 28 leaders on one issue or we'd never get focused. But on the other hand, if you have right. only one leader and he or she doesn't have any support, then the work mm -hmm. will be done because it's, it's hard to be a lone voice out there. Uh, I would assume yeah. I've never been totally. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think of different people over the year who, who were lone voices or virtually lone voices in so many ways, and and some of them made great impacts. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, a man named Bob Walker, who was an active Sierra Club, mm -hmm. and a and a photograph, a photographer, I guess is the word, photographer, and um, he did a lot of work in helping expand the East Bay Regional Park District. He would mm -hmm. do aerial photography of the hills and Eastern Contra Costa and Alameda counties. And aerial. Aerial. He would, somebody would fly the plane and he would stick his thing oh, wow. camera out. Of the because there was no, no drones, no drones yeah. back then, right? <laughs> You're in a plane. And, and his, his, his collection of works are actually um, now owned by the Oakland Museum. Oh, and, wow. But through his art and um, activism, he motivated the park district. He was a main stimuli of the park district to buy a lot of the lands that are now parks and take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And two counties, uh, yeah. So he was he was a real. I didn't know him well. I had met him a few times. Um, unfortunately, passed away uh, fairly young, mm -hmm. uh, meaning mm -hmm. anything less than ninety. Uh, no, he he was I believe in his fifties. <laughs> um, yeah, this is young. The older young is. Let me tell you. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to live forever, so, you know. <laughs> Age is a relative term. Um, great, but uh, in today's, you know, our leaders are maybe not doing aerial photography, but are doing other things, and they, they need the back of support of the uh, other Sierra Club to, to get the support and the work done to show up at meetings and say, you know, I'm Joanne Drabeck and I volunteer for the Sierra Club or I'm a resident of Oakland and I support the purchase of this land for our regional park. 
kind of thing, which I can manage. Well, Ian, and you write that you mentioned that uh, people, I think, uh, you know, not everybody, obviously, but many people take for granted what we have. And, you know, I'm just constantly reminded, you know, stories like you just told that behind every accomplishment, there is a person who started who had a vision and who started organizing others and, and assembling and, you know, whatever they needed to do. I mean, in, in many cases, you need to convince legislators or you need to convince elected boards like the, the parks district, et cetera, to, to do something and do fundraising. So, so, so there's a lot of work that goes into any sort of seemingly um, easy accomplishment or all the hills and the, in Alameda, Contra Costa counties and Marin counties, you know, people people just love those trails, right? But there could have been houses all <laughs> over <laughs> the coast, yeah. I guess it's it's a, it's a constant battle between you know people want to have the land for development, which you know we all also in the housing crisis, obviously, so it's always a tension. But I think that we have so much space in the inside of the cities and towns that we, we we can leave the open space alone so so what are you passionate about now i know you are you are the the you know the um uh, working with the sierra club now is obviously pandemic so it's difficult to organize you're also doing the green fridays right still on zoom i still, help. Green, I still host green fridays on uh on Zoom uh, since last March. Um, mm -hmm. So Green Fridays are monthly educational uh, evenings. Uh, we, when we met in person, we had a social half hour and snacks and we met at the chapter mm -hmm. office in Berkeley, um, probably for about 15 years. And wow. we, um, had different speakers over the years on various topics. Um, we found that the summer attendance was pretty low, so we do it during the school year. And um, the presenters usually do a style I'd show, they do talks, and it's been a wide range of environmental or environmentally related topics. So the last one was on local mountain lions and tracking them and keep, Watch. Damn, I should have been there. <laughs> yeah. And um, the next one is, is on uh, financing. Uh, you know, how do your investments uh, and affect what happens in our uh, environmental world? And then, um, or in, in this case, uh, especially having to do with uh, global climate change. Mm -hmm. uh we've had all kind um of people we've had educators uh people who have defended animals people who have tried to talk what uh ranchers in marin sonoma and mendocino mm -hmm. counties to not uh kill wild animals even though they might hunt some of your livestock how do you get and wildlife to go, you know, live side by side. Um, I can never remember the. Wildlife. I know you had one of my friends. I think was talking about bats. She she's doing yeah. a movie about yeah. bats. Yeah, yeah. bats. <laughs> We've learned about frogs. Um, yeah, it's 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 been a lot. Yeah. The water systems, you know, from uh, someone from Holy. Uh, H2O came and talked to us and it's, we've got just a, such a wonderful water system. We're so lucky here in the, I'm in the East Bay and I'm, the Bay Area and generally um, yeah. districts are fairly responsible and um, really good things. Uh, we have amazing water here compared to other places. <laughs> I have to say we really take it for granted, but yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, I try not to, and I, you know, it's sort of like we do need to, mm -hmm. like, we need to fight for democracy. You need to fight for your clean water and not take it for granted. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, that's that's very true. And I think that a lot of companies are trying to, you know, why buy, buy water rights and, and et cetera. So yeah, you yeah. cut you cut access to water. That's it. You know, and a lot of us not really thinking in that in that direction. For sure, I, I should I should make a point to come to to uh, to your Fridays definitely. Well, uh, remind everybody what uh, when again, um, so which Friday of the month? We meet the second Friday of the month. Um, the doors open at seven, and even on Zoom, we uh, the hosts and the coordinators sign on. <coughs> excuse me, about seven, mm -hmm. and then around seven thirty, I start the program with a welcome and any announcements I might have, and then the presenter um, set presenter talks for about an hour and uh depending on the program their questions either during the program or after and um usually when we met in berkeley needless to say most of the attendees were from berkeley and oakland and alameda, berkeley <laughs> albany and uh alameda uh but uh when we've been um on Zoom, we actually quarantined from India, the country India. Um, wow! Because <laughs> friend of theirs was giving the talk on, you know, how to fight climate change and his solutions um, on everything from ways to design forests and do forest cutting in communities to uh, reduce forest fires to raising food, to uh, changing car patterns. And, uh, you know, he's really given a lot of thought about it. And um, wow. it, he is, uh, oh, I can't think of it. He's Indian. Um, he immigrated mm -hmm. to the United States as a yeah, much younger person, adult. And, um, Actually, I think he was uh, in high school. And then, uh, yeah, so you, you get a... The, the but he is now in India and call, was calling from India? No, the person, well, on Zoom, all you do is, you know, get on your internet and it is... Why it, not? It, so you take advantage of the silver lining that any platform gives you. And this is one is, you know, we've had people from the East Coast because they... Uh, knew somebody mm -hmm. or daughter had said, hey, this topic you'll like mom and dad or um, things like that. Wow. It, 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 it's all been a, a different, uh, different thing. Do you, record, do you record those meetings now or? They are recorded. Now, we would, I don't know exactly how to tell you where to find them, but they are we totally need to upload them somewhere on the on the Sierra Club uh, website or something. Or I mean, Zephyr, who is helping us today, also thank you so much, Zephyr. He's listening to us. <laughs> uh, maybe we can do that because it, that, I think that would be a great service to people. I would love to go and listen to some topics. Obviously, mountain lions. Damn, I want to. I've been wanting to see one for so so long, and I've never seen. I've seen you know the bobcats and rabbits obviously, and, and deer and elks and a lot of wild and raccoons just, you know, in the neighborhood. <laughs> yes. But I haven't seen a, mount, a mountain lion, so I was like, I want to see yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'm trying to think. I don't think I've seen one uh, in the Bay Area. But uh, mm. uh, Thor has. And they, there's a They've been reported in the in the paper, and um, the ones that I, the people I know who have seen them, other than my husband, are also hunters. Still alive. <laughs> they're still alive. They're, they're hunters, so they have. Even though they're not hunting in the regional parks, they have that eye for um, being aware of what to look of for. Of wildlife. Yeah. Wow. wow. Oh. Yeah. Maybe that maybe they can take us on a tour or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, if, if you can only predict where the uh, mountain lion would be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, coyotes. Also, I've seen a lot of coyotes. Actually, yeah. you know, very up and close 
too. So, but what are what are you sort of passionate about now? I mean, obviously we're sort of in the in a slightly different world this uh, you know last year and this year. So, most of my um, volunteer work with the Sierra Club is is just is getting people involved or getting people together and. Um, need to think about how do you do this um, in the days of COVID. And, you know, personally, I'm very excited about these vaccines that are coming forth and uh, the potential of uh, being vaccinated and mm -hmm. the potential of having this disease not be so life-threatening to so many people. Mm -hmm. and, um, such a an exhausting uh process you know even though i'm i have no complaints personally of having mm -hmm. to stay home uh i i get to go and walk in the beautiful regional parks uh every day i born and i found trails that are um the multi-use trails that are very wide and it's very easy to mm -hmm day six eight ten feet away from people um and most people wear masks on the trail mm -hmm. so you it, you feel fairly safe um and i don't need to work so i'm not i'm retired and i um mm -hmm. i don't need to go out to go shopping you know those kinds of things i'm very lucky that thor does the uh, grocery shopping and um, so it's hard, you know, it's sort of like passions have kind of got by the wayside because I spend so much time just at home, but getting people together is, um, what I, I like to do and give them opportunities to get to know each other, um, beyond this is how you knock on a door. If you're going to go canvassing or if you're going to, you know, yeah. ask people to vote or sign a petition uh kind of thing that all those things you can't do while during COVID and um, yeah. so uh I'm I am working with some of the outreach committee people to think about what what can we do uh, what can we do yeah doing doing this next year so that um all this isn't lost since I think it, it will probably be you know, almost another year before large gatherings or face-to-face are going to be yeah. able to, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, th I think you're right. And I think that there are so many, um, to your earlier point also, that there are so many opportunities to bring people who traditionally could not attend or, you know, be a part of the of this community just because, you know, they, they cannot drive. I mean, it, right. I'm sort of happy sometimes. I mean, we we are lucky that we live in a Bay Area. That's true. We, we have access. A, we have weather conditions that allow us right. to, to go, you know, in the middle of the winter to go outside and enjoy you know lemons growing on the tree that's right <laughs> you know uh yeah pe people people in other countries and other places are not you know don't have that uh luxury um but you know right now there's so many opportunities to connect and i hear that that people are getting more involved in in legislative processes and volunteering and just you know uh getting together on zoom because Yes, you cannot physically touch somebody right now, but but I think that that emotional connection is just so much more. People are understanding how important it is, you know. Wow. Social distancing is wrong, you know. It's 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 really physical distancing, but socially we should you know be uniting. So, but you know, I want to come because I'm just personally interested. <laughs> <laughs> You've been, you know, married for for so long. So, what are the what are the tips? Because I think a lot of the tips of the intimate relationship also sort of translate into other relationships. So, what are the what are the secrets? <laughs> you know, I, few. It's sort of like I think. One of the things um, is, you know, it's the, the cliche is like, don't sweat the small stuff, pick your battles. And, uh, but it's, I think it's more than that. I think 
when I, um, one of my early jobs with children going way back um, before uh, mm -hmm. and I had agreed to move out to California together, I worked with a woman who was my, uh, you know, a generation older. I was, I was the same age as her sons. And um, she told me when I said I was going to get married, she said, well, make sure you tell him good, I love you every night. Wow. And, and that's advice I've given to many newlyweds of my children's generation, because if you say those words, the irritations of the day kind of melt away and you're not, you don't just say them, you, you mean them, you know, you sit back mm -hmm. and, you, and you know, it's, it's, why do you love this person? Sometimes, you know, it's usually I don't, I don't give it too much thought, you know, it's because the, the, mm -hmm. the, there aren't any issues right now or kind of thing, but when, when there are disagreements or issues or irritations, it's just kind of like puts, those things in perspective, and um, mm. and I think that that makes a difference. And then um, you know, I just think was I lucky or fortunate to find someone who you know were intellectually compatible. Um, we like to do the same kinds of things and yet we don't do everything together. Um, mm -hmm. That's important that we respected each other's spaces, um, support each other. If it, there are conflicts, you kind of like, you make those compromises and uh, it's not always your way sometimes Sometimes you just let the other person have their way because it may matter more to him than it does to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think that, uh, yeah. And, and when, I think during the most stressful times the kids were much younger and, um, and I was very involved in like too many volunteer works. And it's mm -hmm. like, you just had to sit there and think like, <laughs> This is this is really hard. Why am I in these shoes? And then figure it out. Figure out what you want to do and and melt. Mm -hmm. um, it was never uh, one person. You know, I made a comment about things were hard, and she goes, "Well, do you want to get divorced?" And it's like that was the last. That would never mm -hmm. on my agenda. And I went home and I thought about it. I said, "No, that that's not the problem." This relationship is not the problem. There might not be enough time for it right now because of all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, uh, I don't know. Just, just that we've, we've always been on the same page of willing to keep the relationship mm -hmm. at a focus, yeah. And as an, a priority, that helps. <laughs> And I, I hear, is, is it on your end that the... <laughs> Somebody doing the dishes. <laughs> you should come, come in and say hi. <laughs> put, put him on the spot, right? That's not on his agenda. Not yet. I would put him on the spot. <laughs> That's, right. that's that's a very wise advice it's it's interesting and then I think that saying I love you because you, you know I also um I'm the, the sort of less unknown part about me and my sort of interest I'm very much sort of into personal development it goes back to you know interest in human psychology and how we operate and what we do and I so in the last two years especially started listening to a lot of um I don't know if you heard that guru. It, it's just, you know, the philosophers, Indian philosophers, I'm always fascinated in that. Yeah. And um, can you hear me? I can. You, you when you when you moved back at we lost my 
You're now you're gone. Can you hear? Me? I yeah. Um, so and um, you know we I think we're so not present a lot of times that how many people do not wake up? You know. So, so I think that that's a very wise advice to just put aside all the all the irritations of the day, you know, the end of the day behind and, and really get present. So I also appreciated your earlier sort of advice about <clears throat> I have I had, you know, similar experience when I was working in veteran medicine, I used to come come before I actually would um, enter my house. I would sit in the car for for a while to just you know, and I have to say you know I I, I back then oh my god I, was like, uh, I I used to actually just cry sometimes because it took you know so much emotional um, strength out of you because you know I was also um, I wasn't working with kids but I was working in emergency you know veteran emergency and I was also a first generation immigrant and sort of adjusting to the language and it, it was it was very stressful so i i use sort of similar technique just to yeah. load your emotions before you before you attend to everybody else just to move on to the next uh, part of yeah. your life. Yeah, 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 it's very, it, it very much resonated. Yeah. Well, now and of course, I'm, I'm trying to practice meditation almost every day, just because it, it, it makes such a difference in my life. You know, where I can be. You're right. Also, another advice that I love that that don't don't take everything. You know, it's it's interesting. I actually don't take yourself too serious, but I, I feel like there's dichotomy there. You know, there are a lot of problems because people don't take themselves seriously and don't feel like they have the impact that they actually do in the world. Uh, and, and the other side of it, people take themselves too seriously. <laughs> it becomes so, you know, we have so many advocates also that, who are constantly frustrated, very serious, very intense. I was like, well, what kind of world are we creating? Yes, we're saving the nature, but we're so damn stressed and so <laughs> yeah, yeah. unhealthy because, you know, then, then what is the value of it? So yeah, anyway, some philosophical questions that I'm, that I'm constantly so grappling. So, and after years of being serious now, I was like, you know what, not for the lack of suffering in my life. I was like, no, laughter and, <laughs> and smile and I think lightheartedness really solve uh, more, more problems. Um, well, we are coming to, to the end, unfortunately, but, but I, you know, anything else that you want to share that, that you want people to know either about you or sort of the, the wisdom? <laughs> wisdom that, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I have any... Um more more wisdom i just hope that um you know if people want to do something they just uh make an effort to try to reach out i know some people are more shy or more hesitant or think that they have nothing to no, no special skill and therefore they don't might not feel like they have something to offer it's sort of like uh there are volunteers who are, are lawyers and they bring those skills to the table and those knowledge and the ability to do things um, like read an environmental impact report more or people with scientific backgrounds. I find that um, a lot of these volunteers that I'm just so amazed, they've gone through the process of getting a masters and a phd and a scientific area and then they bring that knowledge to work in the, in the sierra club and i'm i'm just always amazed but not all of us have the drive to go and get that phd or you know we, you know that that's a tree it's beautiful and then there's the person that thinking of a man in particular right now who has his degree, um, botany and so it's not a particular kind of oak it's not like I mean I'll say it's, a, it's a, an oak it's an evergreen oak 
and he will tell you it's a blue oak, a black oak, a yeah. coastal oak, yeah. and so on. And uh, you know, we we all have different levels of knowledge, and and yes, he can read uh, an environmental impact report on. Uh, you know, fuel management and have a lot deeper in understanding, but he can also educate me or other people at a meeting and each of us can write a letter to uh, yeah. support what the Sierra Club wants to say to a city or regional park district on, on fuel management, those, those kinds of things. So there are all kinds of things. And, and sometimes um, I, for years, was involved in the East Bay Regional Park no, it's East Bay Public Lands Committee. Lands Committee. <laughs> it's one of the committees of the of the Seven Bay chapter. We have we have many of them. Yeah. And, um, and and I knew nothing, and uh, someone told me what was going to happen uh, through that window. I was hoping you could see the beautiful backyard. Um, is is Chabot Regional Park and which wow. glare. So. Um, but they had a plan, uh, oh, probably about 30 years ago now. And virtually what it would have done is clear back, clear cut my backyard at the time it was a lot of scrub. And now it's grown in, all that scrub has evolved into uh, oaks and um, laurels. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different place than we moved in 40 years ago. So, um i didn't know anything but you just start attending and you listen and you read all your emails or half your emails on the subjects and and you can participate and learn on something that might become more interesting to you and that was one thing that got me involved because it was literally my backyard that they were talking about oh. this um yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a good point that just get involved, you know, come. I mean, I I'm hesitant to invite people sometimes to our meetings just because, you know, we get into such nitty gritty details and and really. Um, but hey, you know, uh, reach out to us. Uh, don't don't wait, especially now. I have to say, you know, my 2020 was um uh, bearable and actually in some ways exciting and uh because i you know i was reflecting on that partially because of volunteering you know yeah. partially because i was engaged involved you know in in all kinds of things for yeah. the club and other 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 issues yeah. well, John, thank you so much you're, oh, you're welcome thank you for talking with me and asking me to be a part of your series oh it's it's absolutely a pleasure and we need to do it again when when we open up and have a little bit more you know opportunities uh, <laughs> we'll well, see I'm looking forward to the day when the chapter has picnics again and i mean those are the things i was organizing uh last february and when all of a sudden it's like everything yeah down and you know and like many people, I thought, okay, for three months, six, and, and so I didn't stay, so I didn't get motivated to move beyond, and now here it is. Um, hey, you know what, I think the fact that you do in Green Fridays is amazing, so we need to advertise them a little bit more. And so, yeah, so yeah, it is it's, it's nice to get people together that way. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you. I appreciate you immensely. Please say, you know, uh, give a hug to Thor. I really appreciate him. Always a pleasure. And thank you so, so much. I I, I personally learned quite a bit and, and I appreciate your wisdom and appreciate your always friendly, always warm attitude. It, it, it's immense presence. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks, Zephyr.